There are some native, non-native lookalikes, uh, like wild parsnip, which has the same seed head, uh, same sort of flower head, only yellow flowers, and the leaves are a little less serrated. Um, you'll see that growing. Does our current situation of escalating? Rhonda? I'm sorry, what? I'm, I'm trying to keep up with the chat boxes that I keep seeing questions popping up. Yeah, um, if you, anytime you want to stop and take the questions, but I, I thought you wanted to get through your presentation first. So um, um, I'm, I'm uh, copying all of the questions onto a document so we can, uh, we can come back to them at any time. Oh, okay. If, if there's anything pertinent to the actual slide, though, we might as well handle them as they come up. Um, anyway, these two are, are uh, frequently mistaken for, for um, giant hogweed, but again, they are much smaller. And if you look at the flower head of Garden Angelica, it, it is sort of a round instead of a flat top. Now, uh, Garden Angelica isn't, um, it isn't invasive yet, and it does have some medic medicinal uh, properties and it is actually edible. But uh, again, I would just stay away from them because they also have the same issues where you can get a rash from, from touching the sap. Um, next. And then we have some similar native species. Please be very careful when you're calling a plant parsnip. Wild parsnip and cow par parsnip are two different animals. Um, the wild parsnip is an invasive alien and the cow parsnip is native. It looks very much like a uh, giant hogweed, but it's about a half size version of it. And the leaves are um, much less serrated. Uh, also, we have great angelica, which is the native version of garden angelica. So if you have to have an angelica in your garden, go for the great angelica, not the garden angelica. They both have the same lovely purple stems and, and round seed, round flower heads. And more importantly, they fit into the ecosystem. There's another one, uh, wood angelica, uh, which is found on woodland edges, um, but it's probably been extirpated in Ontario. It's still common in parts of the eastern U.S., so maybe we'll bring it back someday. Next. Number eight on the hit parade, Japanese knotweed. Now, if you recall, um, the Invasive Species Act actually has four different knotweeds. Toronto is just concentrating on the one, um, but frankly, it doesn't really matter because there isn't anything native that is going to be mistaken for this. So if they get any of the knotweeds out, that's a good thing. Um, the thing about the, the identifying feature for knotweed is every time you have a new leaf node, the plant, the stem sort of changes direction. So you'll get sort of a zigzagging going on, kind of like zigzag goldenrod, but entirely different leaf structure. So you won't have a problem identifying it. It is really difficult to eradicate, if you'll see on the next slide. Somebody very, oh, sorry, that, that hedge um, is actually growing up the street from me. And this is what somebody has done to, on the other side of the hedge to try and control the uh, Japanese knotweed. They have planted one of my favorite plants, the native cup plant. Now that's one of the plants that um, New York actually calls invasive, even though it's native, because it is pretty aggressive. It's got a really intense root structure. And I'm really watching how this uh, cup plant that they kind of got from my garden uh, is battling it out against the neighbor's knotweed. And I'm really hoping, really hoping that the um, bylaw officers get in touch with the number of people that are growing Japanese knotweed as an ornamental. Um, somebody actually planted it over in a community garden, uh, which is the picture on the right, and <laughs> that's it only a few weeks after it was planted. Uh, we dug it out about five years ago, and I am still dealing with the re-sprouts, even though it was pulled out almost immediately after it was planted. Next. Okay, so telling the difference between giant bohemian and Himalayan knotweed. Um, the first one on the uh, 
left is the giant knotweed. Um, it has interbred with Japanese knotweed to form bohemian knotweed. So the giant one has the heart-shaped leaves, the Japanese has more of a spade shape, and the bohemian can have both. Uh, it usually starts off with heartlet-shaped leaves at the bottom, and as it gets up towards the ends of the branches, it, it, they turn into more of a spade shape. But these plants can cross and back cross and recross, and you can get all kinds of mixtures. Um, the Himalayan knotweed, uh, this is where the Ontario Species Act got it right. That is just starting to appear in Ontario. So by naming it as an invasive species now, we have a chance of keeping it out. And you can get this particular slide from the invasive species center.ca. It gives a lot of good information if you care which knotweed you've got. I don't, I just want them all gone. Next. Okay, sorry, one thing about knotweed, if you do dig it out, um, if you do dig it out, I want you to put it in a garbage bag and leave it on your driveway for about a month in the hottest sun you can, you can find before you compost it. Uh, you might get away with putting it in your green bin, but those darn things will re-sprout. If there's any life left in them at all. Um, Phragmites is one of those weird plants that most people know by its species name rather than its common name. European common reed is what is used to thatch houses over in the UK. But here it is, an invasive species that clogs our waterways and chokes out native species. It grows up to 15 feet high um, and it can, it can actually lower the water level because it sucks up tremendous volumes of water. So it can grow, it doesn't have to be in standing water, it's got really deep root systems and it will find water from the water table even if it's in a drier area. Not bone dry, but uh, if there's any water down there, they'll find it. Next, it can be really difficult to distinguish our native Phragmites from the European Phragmites. So you look at the stems and you'll see a little bit more red on the stems. Um, the leaves are more of a yellow as opposed to a blue green for the European ones. Um, there's a little difference in the leaf nodules, and you, you can pull off the leaf sheets off the native one really easily. On the invasive one, they're a lot tougher, and the invasive ones also have a much larger seed head. They're, they're quite spectacular, actually. But uh, I wouldn't recommend um, anybody who's not really familiar with Phragmites trying to identify it on their own. And that's why it's also kind of dangerous to have a bylaw officer. But fortunately, it's really unlikely that most people will have Phragmites on their property unless they're on a ravine lot. Next. What is an ivy? The plant we love to, we hate to love, love to hate? I'm not sure. Um, it's a really important food for birds, deer, and insects, um, moths. Eat, eat it as well. It's an early successional plant, so its job is to go into a disturbed area and prepare the soil for more particular plants to come afterwards. Uh, it's really structurally diverse. Uh, you can find it as a ground cover, a vine, even a shrub. Um, you can go with the, the three leaf shape, but that's not always a great indicator. Um, we were brought up on the mantra leaves a tree, let it be, and that's a really good, um, really good thing to keep in mind. Uh, it is really easy to get rid of. Um, you don't want to get the, the, your soul on your skin because uh, you will get a, some people will get a rash. Um, there's about 10 to 15 percent of people never get a rash from it, but it's something that builds up with exposure. So you may get along with poison ivy for years and then all of a sudden one day you'll come up with a rash from it. It's just a matter of building up a tolerance. It's opposite of building up a tolerance. You build up a sensitivity to it. So the more you're exposed, the more likely you are to have a reaction. Um, if you get it on your clothes, 
um, wash it in hot water and leave it out in the sun to dry. If you get it on your skin, um, detergent, or if you don't have that, uh, vinegar or alcohol diluted will help. Uh, it usually grows in conjunction in the wild with jewelweed. And some people say that that's curative. I think it's more palliative. Uh, it, jewelweed has a lot of moisture content, so it will feel soothing on your skin, but it, it's probably not going to do anything to dissipate the, um, the sap that you're getting off the, the milkweed. Whatever you do, do not burn it because uh, the smoke can get, gets in your lungs and can irritate them and you can have severe breathing problems from that. The, the easiest thing is to cultivate the soil it doesn't do well uh, if the roots are disturbed. And if you can't do that, solarize it with uh, black plastic or even just put layers of cardboard over top. And if it's growing somewhere out of the way in your garden, let it grow. If, it, if it's next to a pathway or, or somewhere that, where people are liable to come in contact with it, fine, it, it can go from there, but uh, it is an important part of the ecosystem. Next. Purple loosestrife, the only plant that is officially designated as a local weed in Toronto under the Ontario Weed Act. It arrived in the 1800s um, because it is a really beautiful plant, but it totally takes over. At least it did until they brought in some biocontrols and um, the, the uh, moths that they brought in have actually, the beetles they brought in have actually been working very well to control it where they've been released. Um, you, you can have, it used to be that the, these things were really famous in the 90s. It was the first really publicized invasive plant because people couldn't figure out why people were so upset about these beautiful purple plants growing everywhere. Look at how lovely that marsh is, but nothing else was growing in that marsh. It, it uh, impacted biodiversity so badly. It was impacting the whole ecosystem, the, the whole food web. Uh, and garden varieties that were once thought to be sterile can cross-pollinate with wild purple loosestrife to produce a viable seed. So um, even if you go into your garden center and they tell you it's a sterile cultivar, don't believe them, don't buy it, or if you, if you buy it, and encourage the, the nursery to destroy them. Uh, it does have a native, couple of native lookalikes. Next. Oh, sorry, this is a non-native one that is now becoming um, invasive in Western North America and it is gradually coming east. So um, if your nursery tries to sell you garden loose strife, it's the same prohibition. Do not take it. Tell them what they can do with it. Um, similar native species are fireweed, blue vervain, blazing stars, and on the next slide we'll see uh, winged loose strife and swamp loose strife, which are native species that should be growing in those um, marshes that have been taken over by purple loose strife. Next, and the final item on our dirty dozen is the annual ragweed. Uh, there are two other ragweeds, a perennial and a giant ragweed, that uh, their leaves are, are somewhat different, uh, not as serrated, but um, ragweed is one of those plants that is everywhere. Um, people um, usually blame goldenrod for hay fever, but this is the actual culprit. It's another one of those early successional plants. They come in, they improve the soil, wherever there's a disturbance. You can see it growing along the edge of the sidewalk there next to that lovely dormant grass that people seem to prefer. Um, and what it's doing there is it's actually preparing the soil uh, for better species to come in afterwards and, and take advantage of that niche. It's also really good at soil remediation. It, it uh, can actually draw out heavy metals from soils. So you'll see it planted where you're doing um, a brown site remediation. Um, the seed, the pollen really wasn't that bad from ragweed about 250 years ago. And what they've been finding is that since civilization has moved in, 
um, the pollen count in the soil columns has actually increased about a hundred times. So when you have a, a really good working ecosystem, you don't get that much ragweed. It's only when you get a disturbed site, like a garden, um, where the soil is being turned up on a regular basis, that ragweed finds a place to take hold. So I, again, I, I disagree with it being on the dirty dozen list, but uh, Toronto has added it. Um, the pollen can travel 125 miles, so I don't know how much good it's going to do to tell the gardener to remove that one ragweed plant that they have in their garden when it's right through the neighboring ravine, park, or, or the neighbor's property. Next. And that's the uh, Freedom Lawn I took a picture of before, and you can see that it's about 50% ragweed. <laughs> Next. Now, the Ontario Invasive Plant Council had a look at the uh, additions to the Invasive Species Act that came into effect on January 1st, and they asked for eight additions that were not taken into account. But um, because I believe in being proactive, I, I think we really should have a quick look at them. I know we don't have a lot of time left, so I'll just go through it quickly. Next. We have the Tree of Heaven, which has a really stinky flower. Um, it's got a really aggressive root system that can cause damage to pavement, sewers, building structures. And more importantly, it's also the preferred host for an emergent threat, the lantern, the lantern fly. So that's an invasive insect um, also from China. And uh, they seek out Tree of Heaven preferentially to lay their eggs. Uh, it's currently spreading across Pennsylvania and the Mid-Atlantic, and it's been seen to feed on a variety of native species as well. Um, it's been on the verge of entering Canada and been on the watch list since 2018 when they started finding that the lantern flies dead on truck grills. So it's really only a matter of time to get here. And what Toronto could be doing is prohibiting Tree of Heaven, which is becoming a very popular tree because it does spread tremendously, uh, to try and prevent the infestation of um, lanternfly. And lanternflies um, has an impact on the grape industry, maple syrup, forestry. You can get up to 12,000 adults feeding on a single tree, and at that point the only way to get rid of them is to resort to pesticides, and they seem to have built up a tolerance for most pesticides, so it's a chicken and egg thing where, where you just have to keep applying more and more stronger chemicals to, to get rid of them, so it's best to keep them out in the first place. Next. That's the lanternfly that is coming soon to a garden near you, hopefully not. Next. White mulberry, uh, again, came from China. Uh, it was part of, came, it was brought into Virginia to try and develop the silkworm industry. And uh, then they found out, oh, it's a pretty tree and it produces a lot of nice berries. Let's keep it and grow it as, an, as a garden ornamental. And unfortunately, um, it's really taken off and it has interbred with the native red mulberry, Morris rubra. And the problem with that is that there's only 217 red mulberries known to exist at this point. They interbreed very easily with white mulberry and with the resultant hybrids. So at this point, um, it's really difficult to tell the difference between, um, and the white mulberry characteristics team seem to predominate in the hybrids as well. Next. Flowering rush, another marshland plant that is choking out our waterways. Uh, native to Africa, Asia, and Europe. Came in as a garden import. Again, it's a very pretty plant, but it causes a lot of damage. A winged burning bush is the next one. And you probably have seen that growing in, in a lot of gardens. It's a very popular garden plant. It has this beautiful bright red foliage in the fall. Um, 
is also um, very easily spreading and, and you can see it growing into forest edges now and taking over there. Um, you can have hundreds of seedlings below the parent plant. That's called a, a seed shadow. And it's e easily confused with uh, native species of Euonymus like strawberry bush, um, which has the, also has green linked stems and our native sweet gum tree seedlings can, saplings can be mistaken for the burning bush as well. Next, I absolutely hate this next one, Asiatic bittersweet. It is um, interbreeding with our native bittersweet, American bittersweet. And uh, it's, it was brought in because it's a very popular crafting plant. You'll see people, because the berries grow right along the stem instead of just at the end, ends like the native bittersweet. Uh, it makes lovely wreaths. It's a very pretty, attractive, different looking thing. And those seeds are eaten by birds and they can stay in the stomach of birds for weeks before they're spread out probably miles from the parent plant. So it's one of those things, oh, it's not spreading from my garden. It's not in my neighbor's yard. No, but it's in the neighboring forest. And it also, as I said, it hybridizes with American bittersweet, making them very difficult to tell apart. If you go into the Rouge Valley, um, you see more hybrids than you do the native bittersweet now. Next. It can take down trees. It's a really horrible plant. Um, that's where I'm starting to lose my voice after all this talking. Norway maple um, comes from Europe uh, in 1756. According to one source, I have heard it uh, as early as the 1600s. Um, it has that black spot, that uh, black spot fungus, and a lot of people think that when they buy the crimson king variety that they are buying the native red maple. They're not. Uh, an easy way to tell the native from the invasive maples apart is to pluck a leaf and squeeze the stem. If it has a white milky substance, that is the invasive maple. Um, it provides a lot of shade, but it also shades out the understory. It's a very prolific seeder and it uh, sucks up a lot of moisture from the soil. Next. Um, common buck form we have gone through already, so I won't bore you with any more of that. But common and buck, glossy buck form are also recommended to be included, have not yet been. Next. So there are hundreds and hundreds of invasive species plant species that are still being sold in Toronto. Um, Kudzu has just arrived on the north shore of uh, Lake Erie. Fortunately, that's not being sold by nurseries unlike these other plants like periwinkle. Goatweed is one of my least favorite plants because you cannot get it out of the soil. Next. And then of course we have our all time favorite invasive plant. Uh, the mixtures of grasses that form a typical lawn. Next, uh, it's the third largest crop in North America. Did you hit the uh, next button a couple of times, Kathy? There, there's some build-ins on that. It is one of the most allergenic plants. It is high maintenance and highly invasive. And yet it is the preferred plant of Toronto bylaw inspectors. Next. This is an emergent threat. It is not a plant, obviously, but it is just starting to arrive in Toronto. It has been in uh, the United States for about 100 years. Um, it looks very much like our earthworms but they don't come in ones or twos like earthworms. You, when you find one jumping worm, you're liable to find a cluster of them. Um, that little ring is closer to the tail end than in the uh, native, well, non-native earthworms. Earthworms are actually not native uh, to North America. And we could get into a whole lecture on why earthworms are maybe not the best thing in the world either. But these Asiatic jumping worms, we have a chance to keep them out. Next. 
that just gives you an idea of the difference between the um, earthworm, the more common earthworm on the bottom and the Asiatic jumping worm on the top. Um, they're very energetic. If you pick one up, it will wriggle and jump and possibly drop its tail. Um, they will probably die off in the cold every year, but they leave behind egg cases and those can overwinter and produce a whole new crop in the spring. And if you have one, you have hundreds. It's spread by soil and by um, mulch and by trading plants. So if you, you're really advised to um, heat treat any soil products that, that you bring in, um, put it out on your driveway under a black tarp for a week or two, spread it out a bit, to, to let the heat really get into the soil or use a propane torch, torch on it and just try and kill off the egg cases. Search through and see if you can find the egg cases. They're, they're supposed to be kind of like coffee grounds. I'm lucky I haven't come across this one yet, so I can't give you much um, advice from, from a personal perspective. Next. Uh, they did a survey of 11 ravines in Toronto. And I apologize, I stole this slide. And those are the four areas that they did find Asiatic jumping worms. And what they're finding is they usually come in very close proximity to gardens backing onto those ravines. So again, people are bringing in soil or they're trading plants and planting them and they're bringing in these egg cases without knowing what they're doing and it's spreading into the natural ravines. Next. Okay, anybody want to talk about bylaws? Toronto has a variety of bylaws that they can use against gardeners. Um, the most famous one is the tall grass and weeds, now called turf grass and prohibited plants. Uh, they've also used um, uh, the property standards 623 and 629, uh, 813, the Tree Act, and um, one that I forgot to put on here is probably maybe under the fence act. Um, I have seen them call cedar trees fences and ordered um, a line of cedar trees chopped down before they had a chance to even become a tree. Now the scary thing about the new bylaw is that the maximum fine is raised from 5,000 to 100,000. And the range of offenses has really increased. You can be charged if you simply obstruct the bylaw officer, if you fail to provide him with um, any paperwork that he requests. Uh, the, the range of offenses hinder or instruct, uh, it's not really well defined. It can be whatever the bylaw officer wants. So if they come in and they say, we're gonna chop down your native plant garden because we deem it weeds, uh, and you say, no, you're not, that's obstruction. If you say that um, that is a native thistle, um, they, can call, they can call that false information if you don't get the identification right. And most of these bio officers really don't have a clue. I, I, the other thing is that these offenses count separately on each day of occurrence. So you can have a 10,000 fine one day and another one and another one and another one. Next. So uh, you've got to look at the definitions. Turf grass is not simply grass. So that's actually an improvement, although they really didn't define what turf grass is. Uh, ground cover of various perennial grasses, <laughs> that's pretty loose. Um, you can be fined for obstructing sidewalks or roadways. And I have seen cases where they are upset because there's a few fronds of flowers that drift over the sidewalk for, for, for an inch or two. I have seen them um, demand the removal of, uh, or, or I've seen them cite garlic mustard when it's been a small patch, and I mean maybe the size of a baseball with first year seedlings uh, coming up. Um, that, you know, you, you're going to have weeds in almost any garden. And it, the fact that they had such a small patch to me was evidence that they are taking very good care of that garden and, and controlling uh, plants moving in. But to the environmental inspector, it became a case of, oh, you have garlic mustard. We're going to cite you for having, an, uh, having weeds and tall grass. 
And at that point, it was only a $200 fine. Now it's a lot more. Um, next. Any other condition as the executive director feels. So somebody was asking, what can we do to stand up to them? Um, what I'd like to suggest is that if you are aware of any cases of uh, the bylaw being applied unfairly, or if you'd like to help people who have or are facing unfair charges, send me an email. I'll put you on a mailing list. And if we find, um, you know, there's strength in numbers. Um, counselors respond to numbers. When, when they came in and cut down my native plant garden as tall grass and weeds, um, they said they never got so many complaint calls. And that probably saved me from having it cut down late again. It, it, it eventually caused them to back off and uh, I've got an agreement with them now that they will leave me alone. Um, other municipal code bylaws affect, yeah, I think we went over some of those earlier. And yes, they do also respond to direct action. 